Welcome to the second podcast in the Jensen Hughes Forensic Series of Forensics Uncovered. I'm John Gow, the Technical Director for Marine at Jensen Hughes Forensics, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Wyskill, the Technical Director for Scotland in the north of England. Mike has worked in the fire industry since 1997, serving nearly 18 years in the fire service, and he has a varied fire service career, including firefighting and command roles across a wide range of risks. During Mike's service, he has deployed to numerous incidents involving a diverse range of operational challenges that involve risks to both life and property. Mike entered the career as a fire investigator in 2007, and since then he's been involved in a variety of marine, industrial, commercial and residential fire investigations. He's experienced in managing and undertaking complex fire scene investigations involving the loss of life, property and personal injury. He's also had the opportunity to investigate marine casualties involving roros, bulk cargo, service vessels and container ships. These investigations have involved cargoes such as vehicles, calcium hypochlorite, self-heating of wood pellets, fertiliser and hot works. Mike has also had the opportunity to experience life at sea by taking a voyage on an ultra-large container ship. Today we are going to explore the International Maritime Safety Management, ISM code, and its relevance to the marine casualty investigation. Good morning, Mike. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks very much for hosting these exciting and informative podcasts. Mike, before we move into the meat of today's topic, you've enjoyed a varied career in the fire service before getting into forensics. Perhaps you can give us a little bit about your experiences. Of course, John. Uh, As you mentioned, I started my career in the fire service in 1997. Uh, During my years of service, I did everything from firefighting to driving under blue lights and incident command. Now, My earliest experience in terms of fire in the maritime industry, since that's what we're talking about today, uh, goes back to my firefighting days. And as you know, in the fire service and back in our day, because you you were back in the fire service then as well, we had plenty of hot fire training exercises. Now, fortunately, the fire service that I was in, they had this mock ship that was used for our everyday type, you know, hot training, but also for firefighting at sea training. Now, this was my first exposure to the maritime world and that experience, it had a unique impression on me. Um, you know, as I, as I learned a bit more about that, I just found it very dynamic compared to the land-based firefighting. Eventually, my career uh, took me into the fire investigation unit and the fire service. I did several years there and I really enjoyed it. I found the subject matter of fire investigation very interesting and I just had a thirst for learning more. I actually recall one time, um, many moons ago now, but you came out to the station where the fire investigation unit was and you shared a bit about fire investigation in the private sector. Now, hearing a little bit about your transition from the fire service to the private sector, well, it took my interest and it also inspired me. Next thing you know, we were working together um, with our predecessor, IFIC Forensics now, you know, Jensen Hughes. And it wasn't long after me being in a company, um, and I'm very grateful that that you you did this, but you took me along as a junior on one of your ship cases, and I was hooked, absolutely hooked. Uh, I've been learning and undertaking marine investigations ever since, and I guess you could say the rest is history. Really enjoy this part of the job, and there's always a bit of adventure and stories to tell. Yeah, Mike, I recall that station visit. It was actually good to see the fire and rescue service engaged in the private sector, sharing knowledge and experience, because they can be two diametrically opposite sides of fire investigation at times. Although I do recall someone jokingly referring to my transition to the dark side. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on to uh, the ISM code, this is something that might not be familiar to some of our listeners. Uh, Perhaps you can provide some brief detail on the code and its purpose. Sure, sure. The the International Safety Management Code, ISM code, is a international standard for safe management and operations ships at sea. And also, you know, for of, of course, for the protection of the environment. 
Now, it has a broad reach across the shipping industry, for example, holding ship owners and ship managers and crew and flag states to account. The ISM code was designed to offer a structure for safety management systems on board ships. As it has evolved over the years, companies have matured with its implementation, and it's certainly contributed to better safety for cruise vessels and the environment. That's pleasing to hear, especially as the fire and explosion problem really hasn't reduced in recent years within the maritime sector. Um, let's hope that the ISM code continues to contribute to improve safety standards on board. Like any industry, there is a broad regulatory framework governing how an industry works. Can you explain where the ISM code sits in relation to that framework within the maritime sector? Well, interestingly, John, the ISM code in itself is a structure offering guidance on how safety can be applied to companies and their ships. But it is the Solus Chapter 9 Regulation 3 Management for the Safe Operation of Ships that requires a ship to comply with ISM code, treating it as mandatory. And it's noteworthy to keep in mind that the ISM code is applied to flag state vessels, um, meaning signatory to the Solus Convention. The objectives of the ISM code, and I'm going to quote this to make sure I get it exactly right, to ensure safety at sea, prevention of human injury or loss of life, and avoidance of damage to the environment, in particular to the marine environment and to property. Now, how a ship company goes about managing the safety and operation of the vessels is up to them, as long as it meets the ISM code. And usually this ultimately will translate into what's called a safety management system, or we often say for short, SMS, and that's what's drafted by a company. Yeah, given the importance of this code to the maritime sector and the safety of crew and vessels, uh, I picked up recently a report um, on port state control inspections, and it is disappointing to still see so many deficiencies relating to fire safety systems uh, picked up during uh, port state control uh, inspections of vessels. And this is probably a trend, I think, that needs to be reversed in the future if we're to make vessels safe places to work and live. Definitely. The safety management system, it sounds like critical to the safe management of the vessel. Can you explain its relevance to the marine casualty investigator? Certainly. Think of it kind of like a risk management system for a land-based commercial industry, but instead it's for the, the maritime industry. It's kind of your health and safety functional processes and procedural documents. The SMS should reflect compliance with maritime regulations and take into account any industry codes, guidance, and standards advised by parties such as the IMO, flag administrations, or classification societies. Now, there is not a one-size-fits-all SMS. Each company has its own operational demands and fleet to consider. Uniquely, this does allow companies to hold on to their own competitive operating kind of status or edge, their competitive identity in the industry. The SMS is that support mechanism that demonstrates the safety practices and safety culture achieved through the people of that organization. The structure and ultimately the delivery of the SMS is to meet the ISM code. The objectives of the ISM code are to establish safeguards against all identified risks. In other words, how are the identified risks being mitigated? Now, this may include, for example, the potential of fires and explosions on board vessels, the things you and I do, you know, when, when, when we're called out to, to investigate um, ship fires. The company's emergency response procedure, the actual delivery of that emergency response, the training, the competence, and the condition and maintenance of equipment may be something that we can consider when we go about our investigation. As an investigator, it can be beneficial to review the SMS and compare it to the observations made in terms of the investigators and information gathering uh, about the incident. 
observations may be made from the physical environment, like the fire scene, you know, the, the area of origin or the, the equipment involved, or can be learned, for example, from, say, reviewing crew witness statements or training records or maintenance records, or even the voyage data recorder can be very, very helpful. Ultimately, the question will be, how well is the company mitigating the identified risks compared to the observations and findings of the incident investigation? This is where a skilled marine investigator, for example, you or I, we can really appreciate the relevance of our findings in the investigation to then apply to you know, the, 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 the ISM code. Uh, given you know, the complexity of managing you know, a, a large vessel, you know, the infor it must be information overload at times. How easy is it to come by this information? But you're absolutely right, John. It can be information overload. Um, it takes a while to, as an investigator, to process all this information in your head. But it's a very good question as well, John. And it really depends. Well, the most extreme case could be if the vessel sinks, well, your physical evidence is gone. But if not, then you'll likely get that chance to get on board and do your kind of, you know, visual inspections and, 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 and such. But this may be limited to how long the vessel's in port. Um, this can impact your overall information gathering to while, while you're on the vessel if you have that limited time. It certainly does focus the mind and target your attention when you're against the clock. Another point to can contend with is how quickly you can get there before the scene has been, you know, altered or changed or repaired. Because um, the vessel, what they want to do is get the vessel back into operation. Sometimes time is on your side and sometimes it's not. Now, in terms of documentation, it depends on who appointed the investigator or under what authority you know you may you might be working. For example, um, when I've acted for ship owners, the information's quite readily available. Uh, I've stood on the bridge and uh, had information downloaded straight from the computer on the bridge. Very helpful. You get it right then and there. On the reverse side of that, if I'm acting for cargo, while some limited information may be provided initially, most of the kind of vessel and crew SMS information that you're looking for, it'll come later during the process of disclosure. Yeah, it's clear that, you know, it can be a complex and time consuming uh, process gathering that information. But it's also clear that lessons can be learned in terms of safety that could improve safety on board. It's not just in these investigations not are not necessarily just about origin and cause. Are there any lessons from your experience undertaking these investigations that can provide learning points that can either lead to companies being in contravention of the Solos Convention or improving safety on board? Well, first thing, John, absolutely agree with you. It's not just about origin and cause. It's very much about the learning points as well. Now, the ISM code requires that a company should identify potential emergency shipboard situations and establish procedures to respond to these emergency situations. For an investigator, this ties into reviewing and inspecting, you know, I've said it already, the training records, you know, competency and the upkeep of the emergency response equipment. Likewise, the SMS should provide measures ensuring the crew and the company can respond to hazards, accidents, and emergency situations involving their vessels at any time, so maintaining a state of readiness. Solus Chapter 2.2, Regulation 15, requires crew members to receive onboard fire safety instructions for their assigned duties. If they are assigned as part of the firefighting team, then through this training, they shall be well organized, familiar with, and capable of using the onboard firefighting equipment. That's what you would expect. In this instance, an investigator will want to request, again, you know, I'm, I'm repeat myself here, but again, the training records um, to, to, to verify the, the trainings there, as well as examining the emergency response equipment and also reviewing the maintenance records to validate that the equipment has been maintained and fit for purpose. 
Equally, crew statements and the VDR can shed some light on how effective this training was during a real life event, because these things do happen. In my time, I've seen a number of deficiencies that could have a bearing on the emergency response. For example, firefighting equipment stowed in a non-standard way in an undesignated location. Well, this could cause confusion or delay in emergency response should that equipment be required. There could have been a change of crew and the crew that's on board at that time of the event might be unfamiliar with where it's been put, this non-standard location, and that could really cause some issues. Depending on the vessel, Solus also requires a specific number of compressed air breathing apparatus on the vessel, which should be stowed in a designated location as per the vessel's fire safety plan. Now, the example I'm giving here was it was a compressed air breathing apparatus that was in a non-standard you know, location. Who's going to know it's there except the one person that put it there? So the equipment should be readily available for the designated fire teams to promptly collect and own the equipment in the event of a fire. Now, I've also seen the likes of in, you know, a, a compressed air breathing apparatus, the face mask. I've seen where the non-return valve seals in the internal face mask. It's perished or poorly fitted. That's not a good condition. This non-return valve serves to separate the inhalation and exhalation air breathed by the wear. It eliminates, as far as possible, the wear rebreathing their exhaled carbon dioxide. Rebreathing exhaled carbon dioxide can affect the respiratory function of the wear. And the, the, I mean, it's it, it's well known within our industry that the presence of carbon dioxide displaces oxygen in air. If there's less oxygen, oxygen. Um, available to breathe, then symptoms such as rapid breathing, uh, rapid heart heart rate, uh, clumsiness, or even some emotional upset or fatigue can result. Um, symptoms occur more quickly at, at physical effort. You know, something like firefighting, of course. You know, it's it's quite a uh, adrenaline type moment. So wearing masks that are in this con this condition, this poor condition, if you will, they could influence the wearer's ability to carry out their operational firefighting, you know, procedures effectively and safely. And this is the last thing anybody wants when they're trying to extinguish a fire on board a vessel out at sea. Another defici deficiency um, that I'm thinking of here is is uh, fire hydrant valves having multiple layers of of paint applied you know, over years of ship maintenance. Um, and it's applied sometimes over the, the moving parts of the valve. Now, this can make it more difficult to open that valve in the event of a fire when you really want that water, you know, definitely at that given moment. Um, this is, interestingly, this is this is directly related to SOLAS 2.2, Regulation 14, which refers to the operational readiness and maintenance of the onboard firefighting systems, requiring that they be kept in a good working order and readily available for immediate use. So you, you, you can see the challenge on that one. The last one that comes to mind is um, another valuable source of information that the voyage data recorder, the, the VDR, you know, in our industry, we, we hear that quite often. Now, if you review that against the likes of the crew statements alongside um, the VDR, at times it can paint a, a, a quite a good picture of how effective the emergency response may have been um, against say the, the the SMS or the company procedures. And this can allow an investigator to form further conclusions or recommendations in terms of compliance with you know, SOLAS and the ISM code. You make some really good points there, Mike. And I remember my days as a training officer when I was in the service and we taught uh, operational crews as well as merchant marine crews for their STCW certification. You know, whilst in training is important, it's perhaps worth emphasising that the training must be realistic. Uh, without realistic training, people don't build the confidence in themselves and their teams uh, so that when they need to perform under uh, stressful situations, they're able to really go into um, remote control and carry out the work uh, that they need to do in that particularly given situation, especially when you're at sea and you're not able to dial 999 and call for the fire service. You are the fire service. Um, so 
uh, is a particularly important point that you make. Um, and it's quite clear as well that some of the lessons that you find during these investigations can be fed back into the safety management system so that procedures and practices can be improved. Absolutely, John. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. If you could select an area of focus that could lead to safety improvements on board, given your experience, what would it be? Do you know what? I think I would pretty much say the same thing you've just said. Training um, and, and practical training. Uh, it was Benjamin Franklin that said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Now, I know ship crews do training, right? We've We've been there, we've seen it, we've watched it. But I would focus more attention to that practical onboard training, making it realistic and repetitive. In my view, if crews undertake more regular onboard practical training and drills, just like you've mentioned, then a lot will come to their attention as they undertake these drills. Not only will they become more familiar and confident with the emergency response equipment that, that they'll need to use, but they'll notice these things like the valves aren't opening because the layers of paint that are on top of them. And they'll realize, right, we better check the rest of them as well. They'll also notice the condition of their, their breathing apparatus equipment to think, hmm, this, this needs to be fixed. You know, they'll, they'll notice that as well. Or they'll be able to sit and, and look at the emergency procedures and go, right, can, can we add any more to this to make it even more thorough and, and more um, comprehensive? So they're, they're, they'll be well rehearsed almost like it's it's second nature you know even to this day i'm confident from the number of times that i've done drills when i was in the fire service that i could go back to the drill ground throw up a ladder or undertake a fire pump drill when i joined the fire service i was told by an old hand that you did all that training every shift for one big job of the year and hopefully you weren't annual leave when that big job happened <laughs> but, <laughs> You know, the rest of it was all bread and butter. You know, yeah. but fire, f fires don't discriminate, do they? They don't discriminate. So all we can do is prepare and mitigate so we reduce that risk from from w when it happens, you know, that we're prepared and we can respond to it. Yeah, not, not wishing to be ageist, but I get a sense there that we still think we're 18, Mike. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> right, Mike. The, the Sorry. mind is willing. <laughs> <laughs> right, Mike, thanks very much for that insight. You know, that was an interesting topic, you know, and does the trend of marine casualties involving fire and explosion seem not to be abating? Uh, I've got no doubt this will remain a focus for both investigators and the relevant authorities following any maritime casualties. You know, the point in preparedness, I think, is well made as the maritime sector moves you know, towards decarbonation, decarbonizations, it's facing challenges and change with alternative fuels, uh, electric vehicles, and there's no doubt that the need to train and properly equip crews for the emerging risk can't be overstated. Absolutely. Now, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Um, I will be joined by our client relationship manager for episode three, Chris Shorten and we will be discussing and looking at how forensics can contribute to the success of the overall claims journey. Thank you for joining Jensen Hughes Forensics. <laughs>